So a couple things before I start the drosh. Uh, first of all, um, I didn't notice this until like just now, but I don't know how well you can see it. This is how it ended up printing by the end. Uh, it just slowly faded. So at first I will know exactly what I wrote, and then I'm going to be going somewhat from memory. Uh, <laughs> So I apologize for that. But, but even before I get into this, I wanted to um, talk about something that, that happened recently. Um, a certain person came to me in, uh, in tears with a confession um, a while ago. He said that uh, he had heard the news about what was happening in Israel, and his immediate response to the friend who told him over the phone was, may God be with the soldiers, and may he speedily send all of Hamas to hell. And he was in tears that he would say such a thing because he, you know, he does believe in Yeshua as we do, and he does believe in Yeshua's teachings. He believes, you know, as Yeshua taught, to, to love our enemies and uh, to pray for those who persecute us. And uh, he, he felt absolutely terrible that he'd said that. And I said, well... Yes, that is definitely an expression of anger, and Proverbs tells us all the time that the anger of man leads to folly. But I want to stop and look at the specific words he used there. May God send all, all of Hamas to hell. Hamas, in Hebrew, is the word for violence. So, so let's say that prayer again, but with a different heart. May God send all the violence to hell. We need to remember that... Uh, and this, and I will never, I don't take this as any kind of criticism as to what the nation of Israel is doing. They're in a, a very hard place. They have to make decisions that we may not entirely understand from our place halfway across the world. But with regard to how we approach this and think about this whole mess, we need to remember, as it says in the scripture, that uh, we war not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers and the darkness in the heavenly places. When we pray for the situation in Israel, let us pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Let us pray for God to be with these soldiers. And let's pray that these people who want to do us harm have a change of heart. Even those who have been raised up in this, in this violent way of thinking, let us pray for them to have a change of heart. And that those who can have a change of heart will be spared, whether by the Israeli soldiers themselves or by God's own hand, just protecting them. Because when a person has a change of heart and repents of wicked ways, the enemy is destroyed. The enemy is cast out. And that is a big, important thing for us all to remember as we think about these things and as we pray about these things. Um, and with that, I'll get into the drash in as much as I'm able to read of it. <laughs> um, if there's anyone here who has a more reliable printer who I could rely on to, to print these for me or something, then certainly that would be helpful in the future. But, so this week, our Torah portion is Noach, which can be found in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, through chapter 11, verse 32. It covers the events of the flood and then Noah's curse on Canaan, God's covenant with Noah, which extends to all peoples across the world, and then the Tower of Babel. The Haftarah portion, or prophets portion this week, is Isaiah 54 through 55, 5. And here the prophet Isaiah speaks of an eternal covenant of peace. Gosh, that sounds really good right about now. Uh, finally, our Brit Chalasha, or gospel portion, is Luke 17, 20 through 27. And here the Messiah, our rabbi of rabbis, says, The days are coming when you will desire to see, to see one of the days of the, sons of, of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, Look there, or look here. Do not go out or follow them, for as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation, just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Now with all that is going on in Israel these days, both with regards to the war and regarding the uh, talks of rebuilding the temple, many of us are convinced that the end times are upon us. And they might very well be, I don't know. 
Uh, to understand the coming of the kingdom of the Lord, we need to understand the book of Bereshit, and understanding Noah and his story is a big part of it. If you were to ask even a staunch unbelievers what stories from the Bible they knew, they would probably reference Noah among maybe a handful of others. Other than the crucifixion of Yeshua, the, sto the story of Noah's Ark and the Flood is probably the most well-known of biblical stories. Even so, there are some misconceptions about this story and some things that deserve a little clearing up. Now, the Torah portion starts by describing Noah himself. He is described as righteous in his generation, and it says that he walked with God. Right here is an interesting question that the sages have debated. Why is Noah described as righteous in his generation? while Abram later is described merely as righteous. Why, having read a multitude of commentaries on the subject and studied many a midrash, I think I've arrived at an answer that I like best, and that's when God tells Noah, I'm going to destroy the world, so build an ark, Noah gets right to it and, and starts building the ark without any follow-up questions. When God tells Abram, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah for their evils, Abram immediately starts trying to negotiate on behalf of those living in Sodom and Gomorrah. So what's the difference between the two? One is merely obedient to God, and this is righteousness for him. The other tries to intercede and pray for mercy upon others that the Lord seeks to judge. His enemies, let's be clear, these were Abram's enemies. He pr and he prays for his enemies, which is what makes him, according to Ra rabbinic midrash, more righteous than Noah. Not merely righteous in his generation, but truly righteous. Let us try to be like Abram in this way. However, we cannot gloss over a couple of interesting details here. First of all, it says that Noah walked with God. Now, I don't think this is a metaphor. As I mentioned in the drash for Bereshit, the word of the Lord was there in the Garden of Eden, of, of, of a tangible presence. The spirit of Messiah, the Malach Adonai, the right arm of the Lord was there. This was a personal presence, uh, as tangible as me walking with any of you in the park. Therefore, when Noah received the instructions to build the ark, it wasn't some flash through his brain, or it, it's not a voice speaking from up in the clouds. It was a face-to-face -face personal encounter with the word of the Lord that Noah had, and the word of the Lord was speaking on behalf of the Father. Now, the word that translates here to ark is teba, which also refers to a box or a chest. Now, most illustrations in children's books about Noah's ark tend to show it looking like an actual boat, a seaworthy vessel. Uh, however, the language here suggests that it's more of a simple box. Uh, what's interesting to me is that the word teba is not the same word used to describe the Ark of the Covenant in later verses. In English, they're the same word, but in Hebrew, those are two different words. Now, the word used to describe the Ark of the Covenant is aron, which means chest, but is sometimes also translated in Scripture as coffin. And there is a very interesting rabbi trail, but for now, I want to focus on Noah, as that is the portion. Uh, the funny thing is the word teba, which describes Noah's Ark, is also the word used to describe the basket which carried Moses down the Nile safely into the Pharaoh's home. A big question that comes to mind here, if God is omnipotent, with the vast infinity of outer space at his beck and call, why choose to shove Noah and his family and all the animals into this little box? You know, well, couldn't the Lord just as easily have lifted Noah, Noah up along with his family and all the animals way up into the sky and then flooded the earth and then set them right back down on the ground once it had dried? Couldn't the Lord have taken them to the top of the tallest mountain and held back the flood from just reaching the top? They just chill there on top of Mount Everest or whatever was the tallest at the time. I don't know. Geography might have changed. For that matter, if the problem is the corruption of mankind, why use a flood at all? Why not simply command the hearts of every wicked person to stop and then leave Noah and his family to rebuild? The smell, yeah. <laughs> there's, a good, there's a good answer right there. <laughs> well, I think the short answer, though, is that because God is not primarily concerned with immediate short-term results. In flooding the earth, the Lord gives it a mikvah, a ritual cleansing, which represents rebirth. Just as a baby is born from the water of a mother's womb, so too was humanity reborn anew through the flood, sparing only Noah and his family. So why have Noah 
physically have to build the ark. Well, Rashi's commentary says this was so that the other people of the world would see that Noah and his family were, were constantly preoccupied with building a vessel in which he would write out the coming deluge. This knowledge was supposed to lead them to repentance or at least give them a chance to turn to repentance. There's also a rabbinic theory that the man known as Methuselah, who is mentioned as part of Noah's lineage, uh, that Methuselah had the longest recorded lifespan of any person in scriptures, unless you bring in Enoch, Elijah, and a few others who never died at all. Uh, Methuselah lived 969 years, just 31 short of a full millennium. And his name means, his death shall bring. Who names their kid that? His death shall bring. Thus, there's a theory, though, that, that at the time of his birth, there was a prophecy that the time of Methuselah's death would bring judgment upon all the world. The theory further goes that Methuselah died on the day that the flood came, or otherwise very close to, and that God had given the peoples of the earth the longest possible amount of time to repent of their sins. And so let's talk about what exactly those sins were. When speaking to Noah about the reasons for the coming flood, the Lord tells Noah that the world, that the world is full of violence. And as I said before, the Hebrew word for violence is Hamas. Thus, when people in America or other countries say that they support Hamas, they are literally saying that they support violence. And the Lord in this passage makes it very clear what he thinks of that. So God tells Noah that the end of all flesh is coming. And then God tells Noah that he must build an ark so that he and his family will survive. Specific measurements are given for the size of the ark, and the materials for building it are specified. Now, I've always found it interesting that the Bible includes specific measurements for certain building projects. We get specific measurements for the Ark of the Covenants as well also the tabernacle and the temple. In this, we can see that God doesn't just give vague instructions that we're supposed to guess at. When God comes to us with special tasks, he gives us specific instructions that we are to follow to the letter. The instructions are for our benefit, not his. After all, had Noah not built the ark according to God's specific instructions, it might have held so many animal, it might not have held so many animals or might not have been structurally sound enough to survive the flood. I do want to say as a quick aside, there are though places in the Torah and in scripture in general where the, uh, where the instructions do seem a bit vague. And I do think that this is very much on purpose because it is in that case meant to encompass a span of potential human behaviors. Now, back to the integrity of the ark though. Gopher wood, for example, we actually don't know for sure what gopher wood is. It's not like you read in the scripture and there's the Hebrew word for a gopher, the little rodent that's in the ground. The word is gopher. So they have no idea what this, <laughs> what this actually is. What was it that Cyprus was one suggestion? Yeah. But uh, Ta Talmudic teachings uh, suggest that this was not water soluble. It means it did not dissolve in water and that's why it was chosen. And then having Noah cover the ark in pitch makes the vessel waterproof. So we see there the, the instructions are for Noah's safety. Often we come across a commandment that does not entirely make sense to us. Why do tzitzit need to be on the four corners of a garment, especially in an age where we don't wear four-cornered garments? One could argue that this is a relic of a previous time when we did wear four-cornered garments. I, however, would argue that we don't fully understand the reason, just as Noah may not have understood why he needed to make the ark of gopher wood and cover it in pitch. Perhaps the reason for tzitzit to be on the four corners of a garment is because of the level of deliberation involved in making sure to don such a garment and to have one. Thus, when we get ready for any day, we prepare to follow his commandments. This point is made further apparent in this passage because only after giving instruction for the building of the ark does God tell Noah that a flood is coming. Build, build a boat. Why? Oh, because there's going to be a flood. Yeah. <laughs> I can say that while I'm not as obedient to the commandments of God as I should be, my attempts to follow them have yielded good fruit in my life. By doing such strange things as waving a bunch of branches around in a temporary dwelling, I've found my life enriched. My life isn't perfectly happy all the time, but it's been far better since I started trying to obey the commandments of God than it ever was when I was following the ways of the world. And when I fail to follow certain commandments of the Lord, sometimes I wonder how much water I just let into my ark. 
Important note here, God says that he will establish a covenant with Noah when he and his family go into the ark. The covenant appears to be different from the covenant that God establishes at Mount Sinai. For his part of the covenant, Noah is to bring two and two of every kind of unclean and seven and seven of every kind of clean animal. Now note this implies that there's some knowledge of what animals are considered clean and what animals are considered to be unclean, despite the fact that Moses had not yet received those commandments at Mount Sinai. The scripture speaks of the idea of Torah being written on our hearts. We often speak of obedience to God's commandments, but the goal of following those commandments is to get to a place where we follow what God says because we want to. That comes with time and practice and often comes from seeing the kind of suffering that comes from living a life divorced of God, God's commands. When we're young, promiscuity and drunkenness seem pretty attractive. Violence also often looks like fun. We think it gets results, doesn't it? And while we may not turn to actual violence to get what we want, often the threat of violence or being prepared to do violence becomes all too common among young men. Once that lifestyle has taken its toll on us, we begin to see the importance of God's commands. I propose to you that the people of Noah's time knew what animals were clean and unclean because the law was written on their hearts. They knew instinctually what was right and what was wrong. Certainly they knew that violence and murder was wrong because they surely knew about Cain, who had been marked specifically for that. Cain lived to be 700 years old, and the time of Noah's flood was roughly 1,600 years after Adam in the garden. This means that the people of Noah's time would have known about Cain from their grandparents, and they would have known about the curse placed upon him. So why did they surrender to the urge to sin and to do violence despite knowing that what happened to, about what happened to Cain and, having the, and then having the law written on their hearts? Well, I can only guess that it's similar to every time we defy our own consciences and do what's wrong despite the guilt we're already starting to feel just for thinking about doing wrong. And they did it to such a degree that the Lord decided to drown them all and wash the world clean. At Genesis 7-1, the Lord tells Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Then at verses 4-5 through five, we read, For in seven days I will send rain on the earth, 40 days and 40 nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. Now here's an interesting thing that we often gloss over. Why have Noah and his family enter the ark seven days before the flood comes? Why have Noah and his family wait in that ark for a week before the rains start? It seems like it must have been a pretty unpleasant in there with all those animals. Uh, anyone who's ever been in a barn or a petting zoo or just the zoo in general kind of knows how unpleasant animals smell. <laughs> uh, the sages of the Sanhedrin have said that at this time, uh, that this time period coincides with the mourning of Methuselah who had just passed away. Thus Noah and his family were sitting Shiva in the place that would be their home for a while. Rabbeinu Bahia's commentary says that this seven days was also an extra extension of time for the people of earth to repent. If this interpretation is true, it's worth really thinking about. Back in Genesis chapter 6, the Lord said that mankind had 120 years until they would be no more. And he gave them Methuselah as a sign that they, that they had until man passed, until that man passed to repent. Then when mankind missed that deadline, God still gave them an extra seven days. If we understand this interpretation as true, it speaks to one simple idea. God wants to hold back condemnation from us. This certainly keeps with the Apostle Peter's understanding of the Lord, for we read at 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some count slowness, but in long-suffering long toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Dear friends, we often say that the Lord does not change his mind and that he is always true to what he says, and this is true. The only exceptions are when he decides to show more mercy upon us than he previously spoke of. Thus, we need to follow his example. At Ephesians 5.1, Rev Shaul, or Paul, as most people know him, wrote, Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. The as dear children part refers to the way that children often mimic and imitate their parents. So, too, we are to mimic God and not in a mocking way, let's be clear. Uh, we, when we see this pattern that God is more merciful than his own law requires him to be, so too must we be more merciful than the law requires us to be. 
Part of the reason that much of the normative Christian church likes to say what the law of the Old Testament has been done away with is the fact that there are so many things that can lead to a death penalty in Torah. I would venture a guess that there are people in this room whose spouses had affairs, but they chose to forgive them rather than leave them. I would venture a guess that some people here have sons who, as adults, dishonored them and generally acted like hooligans, but they have not disowned those sons and certainly haven't dragged them out to be stoned. There may even be women in this congregation who were not virgins when they got married, but they were not put forward to public disgrace and, again, not stoned. For that matter, there may well be in this synagogue people who have, in the past, turned to practicing sorcery or witchcraft or tried to speak to the, ge speak to the dead via a Ouija board. And honestly, I think everyone in here has at some point violated the Sabbath even after becoming a messianic and striving to follow the Torah. I know I've done that myself. So how can we say that we follow the Torah if we're not putting to death those who commit adultery or dishonor their parents or fornicate or practice sorcery or violate the Sabbath? Well, there are two answers to this. The first is that just as God is slow to condemn and abounds in mercy, so too are we to do the same. At Hosea 6.6, 6, the Lord tells us, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Now, given how many commandments there are regarding sacrifices, we know that the Lord wants sacrifices. Let's be clear. He would not have given such commands if he did not want us to follow them. This is an example of the idea in Jewish rhetoric called kal Omer, in which the importance of one thing is emphasized by diminishing another. Um, the... My mentor, Rabbi, taught, taught me this idea in terms of uh, Crocodile Dundee. When, when there's a guy who tries to mug Crocodile Dundee, he pulls out a little switchblade, and Crocodile Dundee says, oh, that's not a knife. And he pulls out this huge thing. He's like, now, that's a knife. It wasn't that the other guy had a spoon, but that what Crocodile Dundee had was so much more of a knife as to make that, that little switchblade seem like nothing, and thus the mugger runs away. The same kind of thing happens with Kalva Omer. You diminish one to the point of saying it's nothing in order to lift up how important the other thing is. So if God, it's not that God doesn't want sacrifice, but rather that his desire for mercy is so much greater that by comparison his desire for sacrifices is moot. And if his desire for the sacrifice of animals is minimal compared to his desire for mercy, how much less would he desire that we punish our fellow human beings compared to how much mercy we are to show them? Yeshua further clarified the importance of this at Matthew 9.13. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous but the sinners. Now the second reason is that when we repent of our sins, we die to our old selves, and we are born anew through the sacrifice of the Messiah. And I've pointed out before that there exists an idea in Judaism that the rabbi's word is law. I have further said that this is not true of me as the rabbi of this synagogue, but rather it is true of the rabbi of rabbis who is Yeshua the Messiah. Furthermore, it is true of his man in the Sanhedrin, Rev Shaul, and of his Talmudim, his disciples, who learned at his feet. It is through the teachings of Yeshua, Rev Shaul, and Yeshua's Talmudim that we must interpret the rest of Scripture. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the, the life I have now, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself bore our sins, his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live, and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Romans 6.11 tells us, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The Messiah himself said at Mark 8.35, For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's sake will save it. Thus we see that to repent is to put to death the old self that transgressed against the Lord's Torah. And in that way, justice is fulfilled while allowing for mercy. Dear friends, far too often the Bible is used as a means to condemn others, while at the same time certain passages, a 
certain passage is often taken out of context when non-believers want to throw the Bible in our faces to get us to, to stay out of their business. The non-believers point to judge not and leave out the rest of the verse as a means of telling us we cannot speak against certain types of behavior. Believers these days have rightfully pointed out that this is taken out of context. And the Bible often does call us to judge and to speak against sin and wicked behavior. But at the same time, I want to draw your attention to Matthew 7, 2 through 5, which is the very context that the non-believers so often leave out. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now here we see that the measuring stick used to judge others will be used to judge us. Therefore, I encourage you to have as much grace with others as you possibly can so that you may receive such grace in turn. And when judging others, we must consider whether there is something in our own lives causing us to be incapable of seeing them clearly. Because sin clouds the eye of the spirit and causes us to see the world through a darker lens. There is a Jewish proverb that says, um, my daily bread is not for me to worry about. My relationship with God is. My neighbor's relationship of, with God is not for me to worry about, but his daily bread is. And that's why I would encourage all of us to uh, certainly donate to the food pantry that the church has so gracefully put downstairs. Now, Matthew 7, 6, Yeshua says, hold on. <laughs> Sorry, because <laughs> now we're getting good. We're really faded. Okay, yes, I remember this. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Therefore, before speaking to a person who is determined to live in sin and before telling them all that the scripture has to say about that lifestyle, consider whether they might be akin to dogs or swine who do not, who do not deserve the scripture from your lips. Now, this is not about calling other people names, like you dog or you swine. No, this, this, is, this is about assessing what you're doing with your pearls and assessing whether or not they will receive your pearls and recognize their value. Give it to those who will recognize it as value. We treat the scriptures as holy, and sometimes that means not giving them over to people who would use them to, trample, to just trample over them and to attack us. Note the example of Noah. When told that the flood was coming, he did not set out to go evangelizing. He did not go through the cities crying for them to repent so that they may be spared the coming judgment. Now, yes, Jonah did that, but Jonah was specifically called by the Lord in no uncertain terms to call Nineveh to repentance. Noah, on the other hand, was called to build an ark, and he did just that. And the people of his time had his example to look upon to see how he was obedient to the Lord. I find that a lot of us assume that we are the Jonah in our situation, called to tell the people that we hate what sinners they are. But the call to be like Noah instead of Jonah, I think, is far more common. In living our lives as close to the scriptures as we can, we will remove the planks from our own eyes, thus better able to see the sawdust in our brother's eye. Moreover, in obedience to God, we may spare ourselves and our loved ones the judgment that comes upon those who refuse to obey God's word. And on top of that, we may, you know, just be a good example. So the floods come, and Noah and his family and the menagerie of animals survive upon the ark while the rest of the world drowns. Now, an interesting note here is that the flood doesn't just come about as the result of 40 days and 40 nights of rain, but the scripture says that the waters of the deep sprang forth. So imagine all the water deep underground bubbling up to the surface at once, all creatures on the earth with the breath of life and all those in, sorry, all of the creatures with the breath of life um, in the ark survived and those outside did not. Then God honored his covenant with Noah and the waters receded. Now, funny enough, the scripture says that the ark came to rest atop Mount Ararat, but Noah didn't actually leave the ark as soon as it touched ground. First, Noah sent out some birds to scout the land, and the first bird is a raven. Now, I think there's a significance in the choice of bird here. 
he sent out a carrion bird into a world that was essentially a massive graveyard in his mind. I, I, what? It didn't, <laughs> didn't come back, yes. It's like, it's like saying, is it truly so dead out there that the world is just a massive grave now? And I further think it's no coincidence that the second bird he sends out is a dove. In scripture, the dove is a symbol of peace. The first dove found no place to land and came back. The second, however, came back with an olive branch. So a bird that is often a symbol of peace returned carrying a symbol of peace. And in this, Noah knows that there is dry land and that the land is flourishing. And furthermore, he knows that the world outside the ark is not just a mass grave. It is not a testament to the cruelty and violence of mankind which had been snuffed out. Rather, peace has finally come to the world a world that had not known peace in over a thousand years. Yet knowing that the world has come, has become peaceful and is flourishing in that peace, Noah remains inside the ark still. At Genesis 8, 16 through 17, God has to tell Noah to leave the ark with his family and release all the animals. Go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring, bring out with you every living thing that is with you, all flesh, birds, animals, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. Now, this is very odd if you think about it. Imagine if you've been cooped up in a zoo for a year, surrounded by nothing but sea from horizon to horizon, every direction. And then your boat touches ground, solid ground. One would think that you'd be so eager to get off that vessel and touch solid ground again that you'd step out immediately, even if it was just for a moment to touch that tiny island in the midst of the seemingly infinite ocean. The rabbis have talked about this at length and have come to a few interesting conclusions about why this might be. One suggestion is that Noah was told that he and his family would be safe in the ark. Ergo, because he had not specifically received any instructions from God about leaving the ark, he thought that they might not yet be safe out there. Another suggestion is that Noah was suffering from a degree of survivor's guilt. As I said, him sending out a raven first shows that he sees the world as a sort of graveyard. While the Bible does not seem to support the idea that places can be haunted in the sense of ghosts of the dead dwelling in a particular place, nonetheless, one can see how Noah might feel haunted by a world where such a great disaster had happened. If there were any familiar landmarks that he might discover, he, he might pass by those landmarks and think, I remember a family that lived here, or I remember the people who fought in this very spot. Certainly survivor's guilt is a possibility. Now, I like to think, though, that some, sometimes it's a little more relatable. See, sometimes in life when things get hard, we take refuge in safe places. Uh, a year ago, I was sick for about two weeks, first with the flu and then with bronchitis. And all that time, I barely left the house. This was both so that I could rest and so that others would be safe from getting sick from interacting with me. Once I'd recovered, I was still a little hesitant to leave the house. Now, part of that was because I'd become so comfortable with the way things were, and another part of that was because I felt safer in my house than I did elsewhere in the world. I had become so relaxed in my environment that I didn't want to leave it. It hadn't really occurred to me that this was supposed to be temporary, that I was meant to rejoin the world and to see friends and family again. In this case, Jennifer, my wife, was like the dove, bringing back olive branches, telling me, it's okay to get back out there. So I imagine that Noah didn't immediately step out into the world again once the ark touched dry ground because he'd become comfortable with what was to be a temporary lifestyle. And how many of us do the same thing? Are you currently staying in a certain place in your life because you've grown comfortable in it, because it provided you with safety during a hard time? It may well be that the safety of that place was always meant to be temporary. It might be time to come out of your ark into the new world that the Lord has stretched out before you. Now, once he left the ark, Noah thanked God, building an altar and making sacrifices from every clean animal and every clean bird. God then promises never again to curse the ground for man's sake, though his every thought is evil from birth. Now, what I found interesting about this is that the first time the ground is cursed for man's sake is when Adam eats the forbidden fruit 
and God says, cursed is the ground for your sake. The second time we get a similar curse is when Cain murders Abel and God tells him that the ground will not yield its produce to him. Really hard thing for a farmer to hear. Uh, the final time that the ground was cursed was the flood. What's kind of sad about this proclamation from the Lord is that he says, though his every thought from birth is wicked. As I mentioned last week, the word translated to evil so often in scriptures is ra, which might better translate to strife. So even, the, even so, the Lord seems to be saying here that every problem that he had with mankind in Noah's time will continue in mankind henceforth. He's saying that even though he went through all the trouble to wash the world clean and give it a fresh start, he knows that the sins of mankind will continue. I think this is an answer to a common question often posed when people are being critical of God or of the Bible. The question often comes up in such discussions, why doesn't God just get rid of all evil? which is sometimes phrased as, why doesn't God get rid of the evil people? What's funny is that the same people who ask that question also criticize God for the flood and say that he's cruel for covering the earth in water. Moreover, they miss the fact that their answer is right there in Scripture if they just stop and think about it. God flooded the earth to get rid of all the evil that came from mankind. Yet that solution was not permanent because evil persisted and returned within a generation. I think that one of the reasons God sent the flood was to show us that wiping out our enemies completely is not the best solution, even when it is justified. He wanted to show us that evil persists, even if he used violence to stamp it out. Only through the sacrifice of his son, the Messiah, will evil be defeated. Only through mercy and kindness can cruelty be eliminated. Returning to our Torah portion, God then blesses Noah and his sons and tells them to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. God also then gives a prohibition against violence against one's fellow man. Whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God, he made man. Now, I find it interesting that this is the first instance in the Bible that God specifically gives a commandment against the shedding of blood of your fellow man. One would think that it would be among the first commandments God gave, given how utterly terrible a sin murder really is. Certainly one would think that after Cain murdered Abel, that would have been a prime opportunity for God to say, yeah, don't do that. Nobody should do this. I think that this goes back to the idea of the law being written on our hearts. Cain knew it was wrong to murder Abel, clearly, because when God came to ask him about what, about what he'd done, Cain immediately sought to hide it. And one does not hide what they've done unless they know it's wrong, or otherwise will get them in trouble. In giving the commandment against murder, God is giving human beings new, isn't, he's not giving human beings new information, he's giving them no excuse. I find myself so often defying my own conscience and often saying to myself, you have an overactive sense of guilt anyway. And while that may be true, as I do often feel guilty about things that friends and family tell me that I ought not to feel guilty about, at the same time, for as much as I've studied God's, God's word, I have no excuse when both my conscience and the Lord's, will the Lord's word tell me this is wrong. I wish it were that I didn't have to repent as often as I do. Now, with all this talk about God prohibiting violence, there is a need to address current events. While God's commandments speak, about, speak against cold-blooded murder, let's be clear that war is a different animal altogether. Our people have every right to defend themselves, and in fact, it is their responsibility to defend their loved ones. Romans 12, 18 tells us, tells us, If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. However, sometimes it's not up to us. Sometimes others insist upon war, even when we'd rather have peace. Sometimes an organization comes along and names itself Hamas, which again means violence. And such wickedness cannot go unopposed. It's not about punishment. It's about stopping it. Pacifists in various world cultures have often understood that peace is the ultimate goal. However, when inaction would lead to more harm than action, when taking up arms would cause less harm than refusing to take up arms, and when violence and war 
um, are inevitable no matter what you do. It becomes even a pacifist's responsibility to take up arms and fight. The idea of total pacifism is a relatively recent idea where you, know, you don't fight no matter what. But most pacifists across time have understood that there always comes a point where staunchly clinging to peace causes more loss of life than war does. In this way, I am a pacifist in the classical sense. Violence is a last resort, but it is sometimes still a course of action we must take. But we must never see it as the ultimate solution, and neither can we take any joy in it. Before attacking an area, the Israeli military drops leaflets warning the civilians to flee, and Israeli hospitals still treat Palestinians even during times of war. Israel shows great kindness even to its enemies and even while at war with them. Imagine that even from a secular perspective, and you will see, hold on. I'm going to skip that part because <laughs> I cannot read that for the life of me. Now, returning to the Torah portion, God's covenant is then established and he promises never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. The rainbow is established as a sign of that covenant. And one can see how a rainbow would be very important to people who just survived a worldwide flood. You start seeing rains again, flat flashbacks come into your mind. Oh no, wait, there's the rainbow, we're good. <laughs> the sun shines through that rain. I'm sorry? Yeah, maybe a bit. Yeah, especially considering what comes soon. Um, <laughs> the sun shines through the rain and gives us the beautiful colors as a reminder that God has said that he will not destroy the world in a flood. A reminder of heaven itself. That's beauty. Okay. After the rainbow is established, Noah goes out into the world, but rather than planting fields of wheat, it says that he plants a vineyard and starts making wine. Now, rabbis have talked about this, and why would he start making wine? And some have suggested that after surviving the end of the world, he could use a drink to calm his nerves. <laughs> in many places throughout the Bible, and certainly um, in Jewish tradition, wine represents joy. It is a great blessing to have so much land that you can use some of it to grow grapes, so much more that you have so many grapes that you can make grape juice. And so much more still to have enough grape juice to where you can make wine. So perhaps in growing this vineyard, Noah was trying to bring some joy back to the graveyard world that he and his family um, now inhabited. Now the problem is that in our desire to create joy, sometimes we go too far. When we abuse the blessings of the Lord, those blessings become temptations to sin. I would also propose now that... that uh, Wine is also necessary for the making of covenant agreements, and this may be another reason why he plants the vineyard. This ancient tradition of using wine in covenant agreements was carried out into the temple and is a foreshadowing of Yeshua's sacrifice. The wine represents his blood spilled for us, and the salted bread represents his flesh broken for us. Thus, when we partake in the salted bread and the wine at Chiddush, or frankly, whenever else, we need to remember Yeshua's sacrifice on our behalf. Perhaps this is the reason why Noah planted a vineyard, because he was looking forward to the Messiah's arrival. It represents the Lord's grace in a very real and tangible way. <laughs> However, Rev Shaul warns us about overindulging in the joys of God's grace. In Romans 6.12, we read, what, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. The Father's grace is not a license for us to sin more. The Father's, sorry, it is not a fountain from which we may just drink as many times as we wish. It is the fountain that when we drink of it, we shall thirst no more. One night, though, Noah gets so drunk that he lies uncovered. Um, it's not clear. Was it in a tent or in a, a cave? His tent? Okay, because it's all faded now. <laughs> now. Um, <laughs> It's important that we treat this as a warning, not just, to, not just against drunkenness, but against abusing any of the blessings that God gives us. Your job is a blessing, but if you start putting it before your family or your relationship with God, 
then you've turned that blessing to sin. Your spouse is a blessing, but if you start putting your spouse before God um, or start putting whatever joy you derive from them ahead of their own well-being, then that becomes sin. Food is a blessing, but if we overindulge ourselves to the point of doing harm or denying meals to others, then in that way we sin. Here Noah abused the blessing of wine. And one of his sons, Ham, saw the nakedness of his father and went to tell his brothers outside. A great many rabbis have interpreted this in a number of different ways um, and saying that it's more than it seems on the surface. On a glance, this passage means that uh, he saw his father naked and immediately went to tell uh, his brothers about it. Now, if that's, the passage, if that's all the passage means, there's still a very valuable lesson there. If you see your fellow believer falling in some way, don't go gossiping about it to everyone else. It is your place to help them back up, to cover them up, and to pick them up from the muck of their own sin if they will allow you to help them. This is especially true when it's a loved one, and even more so if it's a person in a position of authority and honor, such as a parent. However, the consensus among the rabbis is that there's more to this passage than what it says on the surface. See, the Hebrew phrase, saw his father's nakedness, carries with it another, another connotation. Leviticus 18 speaks of this, and those of you who know Leviticus 18 know what I'm talking about. I'm censoring the speech because there is a child in the room. Uh, but uh, so many rabbis have said that he, he wasn't just mocking his father, but had done something far more sinister to him while he was in there, in that drunken state. Now, I'm not sure that I completely agree with that. It is important to know that that's an interpretation but I don't think I agree with it completely because when Shem and Japheth hear about it, their response is to walk backwards and cover their father up. One would think that if Ham had done something as sinister as a lot of the rabbis said he did, the reaction would be a little bigger than, hey, let's just cover him up. You know, someone did that to my dad, even though we have a very strange relationship, I'd probably want to beat the tar out of him. Uh, <laughs> wouldn't be right, but I'd want to. Now, um, I think, though, that we can better understand this not by looking to Leviticus for answers, but what happened earlier in Genesis. See, the previous time that, uh, that nakedness is mentioned in the book of Genesis is after Adam and Eve eat the forbidden fruit. Previously, they had been clothed in light, and then when they sinned, that light was gone. Then they were naked, and they were ashamed, and they tried to cover themselves in fig leaves. The Lord, however, clothed them in animal skin. Now, this is one of many examples in Scripture where the Lord, what the Lord wants for us is better than what we're trying to acquire for ourselves. But what's important here is that the Lord covers them. This is both to cover their shame, but also you know, to cover their vulnerability. Because when you're naked, you're vulnerable. Thus, him covering them... Hold on. It's not simply for shame, it is to keep them safe. And Matthew 25, 36 through 40, our rabbi of rabbis talks about the importance of clothing the naked. And he says that any time that we clothed the naked, it was as if we clothed him when he was naked. And any time we refused to clothe the naked, it was as if we left him to the elements. Thus, I think the bottom line is that Ham, in seeing that his father was ashamed and vulnerable, should have stepped up to cover it up. But rather than do that, he told the whole world about it. And I know that's only two people, you know, but it's, it's, it's all that's left. It's basically the whole world. He went and told everybody. <laughs> so, friends, there will times when we will find ourselves, metaphorically, naked. Our shame will be exposed, and our vulnerabilities will be on display for other people to see. When that time comes, let's hope that we have friends and loved ones who follow the examples of Shem and Japheth, who come to cover us up. And let's hope that they will cover our nakedness and our vulnerabilities and keep it a secret. And when the opportunity comes that you see someone else who is exposed and vulnerable, please follow Shem and Japheth's example and cover them up. Proverbs 17.9 says, He who covers transgression... Um, something about love. <laughs> Seeketh love, yes, thank you. He who covers transgression seeketh love. He who repeats a matter separates friends. Let us not do as Ham did. So Noah wakes up, he's furious at Ham, and he 
says of Canaan, of Canaan, his son, he shall be a servant among his brothers. And while this is generally treated as a, as a curse that he's placed on him in retaliation for Ham's crime, I actually think that instead it's a, uh, it's a prediction. It's a prophecy. Because, when, because Ham had shown a lack of self-control here. Whatever Ham's actual crime was, whether it was just refusing to cover his father and instead telling everybody else about it, or if it was the more sinister interpretation that a lot of rabbis have talked about, nonetheless, he showed a lack of self-control, something that he had probably already passed on to Canaan. And when men have a lack of self-control, they will be controlled by others. Every law that human beings make is essentially a threat, saying, if you do this, we will do this terrible thing to you. And if you resist that, we will kill you. And sadly, our society and every society that has ever existed, as far as I can tell on this earth, has needed threats to keep us in line because so many human beings lack self-control. Okay, now the portion does not end with this curse. It goes on to talk about the Tower of Babel. Now, um, again, these notes are very faded, but... I'll just say that uh, the Tower of Babel is a very important story. I actually think that what they were trying to recreate there with the tower was uh, akin to what Jacob saw and is referred to as Jacob's ladder. But the word for ladder isn't used in that spot. The word is migdal, which is the same one translated to tower here in the case of Babel. Thus, they were trying to create their own way to ascend and descend from heaven and uh, and that was why the Lord put a stop to it. It would have been essentially the largest idol ever created. Now, what's, what I thought was important here was that uh, God says um, they, are, they are one, and therefore nothing will be denied to them. And that's very important, because, first of all, because it talks about the importance of us being one with one another. The word there is echad. Very important for us to be one. And yet at the same time, let us be careful that we do not become echad or one in a way that is contradictory to the Lord's will. Because that's when he sees the need to send down confusion and stop whatever it is that we're working on. We cannot let anything become a new Tower of Babel for us. Okay, let me see. So at the beginning, we mentioned uh, the portion in the Brit Chalashah where the Messiah talks about how the days of the coming of the Son of Man will be like unto the days of Noah, that they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, and then all of a sudden the flood came. Um, for this reason, we need to constantly be on guard, constantly vigilant, not in the sense of, oh, is that a sign of the end of the world, but in the sense of, what am I doing to prepare? For it. And I don't mean go buy up all the canned goods and store them in your basement somewhere. Just, Sir, the, toilet just the toilet paper, yes. Only the toilet paper, because that's gold. But, uh, <laughs> but no, rather, we prepare for doomsday. Our doomsday prepping is all in here. Now, it is important to be prepared for emergencies and things like that, certainly. But uh, the Messiah specifically says not to put our trust in gold or silver and things that thieves can break in and steal and moths can come in and eat. Uh, make no mistake that, that however good your panic room is or your bomb shelter or whatever it is, someone can still break in and steal. Bugs still can get in and eat it. But what's in here, that's what the Lord protects. And that's the preparation we need to make. And there are people these days, he said... The Messiah said that they would still be marrying and giving in marriage. But the weird thing that I've found these days is that there are a lot of people who are very soured on the very idea of marriage. So in some cases, they want to live as if they were married couples without actually making the commitment to be a chad. And uh, that's it's a very destructive thing that I think that people don't even realize how much they are hurting themselves and each other when they do that. And then there are some people who are pushing on the idea of polyamory and refer to monogamy culture as toxic. And I, I would like to challenge some of those people. Okay, you, you want to have your polyamory? Sure. When you're old and sick, will any of the lovers that you amassed for yourself come and take care of you? No, a spouse does that. 
or your child does that, or a family member does that. So let, so, but one can see, in some ways, if you really dig, why they would start to think that monogamy culture is toxic, because so many of us do complain about our spouses and about the things that we lost when we got married. Stop it, you two. <laughs> and when we have good things to say about our spouses, too often it's just to them and not to other people. Uh, that's why I try to make sure to mention Jennifer in, in a lot of these sermons to let you know. She, this is a wonderful lady right here. She's made my life very happy. So those of us who are married, let's show them how happy marriage can be so that then they will turn away from this polyamory because it's not fulfilling. It doesn't do anything for them other than some fast, quick joys. And, uh, hold on, I'm still trying to figure out some of these. Let us also remember to beg for mercy even upon our enemies, even upon people we dislike, and people who absolutely tick us off. I need to be better about, about doing that for the, the people who run the unemployment insurance offices because they have absolutely made me livid. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we do need to pray for mercy upon them. And if we should find ourselves in a situation where God gives us a very specific vision, let us make sure to do what the Bible says and follow it down to the letter. Shabbat shalom.